morning to you. Welcome to this special coverage of the Senate proceedings. This is a special sitting, and uh, it is for the hearing and determination of the proposed removal from office by impeachment of Governor Ferdinand Dungu Waititu Babayao, the governor of Kiambu County. The senators did meet in camera soon after walking and taking their seats in the chamber, but right now this session is open and you will be able to follow the proceedings live courtesy of the Parliamentary Broadcasting Unit. Governor Ferdinand Waititu was impeached on 19th of December 2019 and um, that particular resolution was forwarded to the Speaker of the Senate. The Governor is accused by the County Assembly of uh, gross violation of the Constitution of Kenya 2010, the County Government Act 2012, the Public Finance Management Act 2012, and the Public Procurement and Disposal Act of 2005. In the accusations, the members of the Kiambu County Assembly argue that uh, there is lack of accountability in the management of county resources by incurring unsustainable debts and other pending obligations to the tune of four billion shillings. These pending obligations were never disclosed in the county fiscal strategy paper 2019, thus violating article 201 subsection E of the Constitution 2010 and Section 107, Subsection 2E of the Public Finance Management Act 2012. The County Executive, under the leadership of the County Governor, according to the MCAs, intentionally failed to draft the medium term debt management strategy for the financial year 2018 2019 in contravention of Section 123 of the Public Finance Management Act 2012. This, they say, places Kiambu County in a highly precarious financial position as it may lead to protracted and costly court battles with the creditors and eventual auctioning of county assets. Also, the MCA's alleged violation of Article 176, Subsection 1, and Article 185 of the Constitution of Kenya 2010, if they say that um, the governor disregarded the county assembly as an arm of the county government and further undermined its three cardinal rules of legislation, oversight, and representation through systematic non-remittance of requisitioned funds in the financial year 2018-2019. The MCAs, and there on your screen uh, for a couple of seconds, Governor Fernand Waititu, he will be invited into the chamber and he will be answering to these particular charges which have been leveled against him this morning in the Senate during this special sitting. Among other accusations leveled against the governor is crimes under the national law. And it, that the county governor committed serious crimes under national law in a number of ways. Among them, violation of Article 40 of the Constitution of Kenya on the protection of every person's right to property and Section 155 of the Land Act 2012 which bars unlawful acquisition and occupation of property through the forceful disposition of land from a resident of Kiambu County. <laughs> time for this particular process is here and uh, the Speaker of the Senate, Honorable Kenneth Makelo Lusaka, has walked into the chamber and he will take his rightful seat and thereafter 
the proceedings will begin. My name is Edward Kabasa. Enjoy your viewing. Order number two, hearing and determination of the proposed removal from office by impeachment of Honorable Ferdinand Ndongo Waititu Babayao, the governor of Kiambu County. Honorable senators, ladies and gentlemen, having dispensed with the pre-hearing meeting of senators, which was a closed session, it is now order members. It's now time to commence the proceedings of the proposed removal from office by impeachment of Honorable Fatna Ndung Waititu Babayao, the governor of Kiambu County. Honorable Senators, ladies and gentlemen, pursuant to Article 181 of the Constitution and Section 33 of the County Government Act 2012, on 19th December 2019, the County Assembly of Kiambu passed a resolution to impeach the governor of Kiambu County, Honorable Fatna Ndung Waititu Babayao, by a letter dated 20th December 2019, reference CAK 1, stroke 19, stroke 1024, and received in my office on Monday, 23rd December 2019, the Speaker of the County Assembly of Kiambu informed, informed it's, uh, it, in, in its 127th and 128th sitting held on th uh, Thursday, 19th December 2019, the County Assembly of Kiambu passed a resolution to impeach the Governor of Kiambu, Honorable Ferdinand Waititu Babayao, pursuant to provisions of Section 33.2 of the County Government Act 2012. The Speaker of the County Assembly also forwarded to me copies of the following document. A, the order papers of the County Assembly of Kiambu for the 127th and 128th sitting, both held on 19th December 2019. B, a notice of motion on the proposed removal of the Honorable Ferdinand Ndungu Waititu Babayao from the Office of County Governor of Kiambu dated 2nd December 2019. And C, copies of documents containing the grounds and particulars on which the propose, proposal for impeachment was made. Pursuant to Section 33A of the County Government Act 2012 and Standing Order 75-1 of the Senate Standing Orders on Tuesday, 20, 21st January 2020, a special sitting of the Senate to hear charges against the Governor of Kiambu County was held during the special sitting. The Senate resolved to investigate the matter of the proposal, proposed removal from office by impeachment of the Governor of Kiambu County in plenary. Thereafter, on the request of the Senate Majority Leader and with the support of the requisite number of senators, I appointed today, Tuesday, 28th January 2020, and tomorrow, Wednesday, 29th January 2020, as days for special sittings of the Senate. The business to be transacted at this special sitting shall be the to in investigation of the proposed removal from office by impeachment of Honorable Ferdinand Ndungu Waititu Babayao, the Governor of Kiambu County. Honorable Senators, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to remind you of the mandate of the Senate insofar as it relates 
to the removal of a governor from office as provided for under Article 181 of the Constitution as read together with Section 33 of the County Government Act uh, 2012 and Standing Order 75 of the Senate Standing Orders. In particular, Article 181 of the Constitution provides as follows. One, a the county governor may be removed from office on any of the following grounds. A, gross violation of this Constitution or any other law. B, where there are serious reasons for believing that the county governor has committed a crime under national or international law. C, abuse of office or gross misconduct, or D, physical or mental incapacity to perform the function of office of the, count of the county governor. Two, parliament shall enact legislation providing for the procedure of removal of a county governor on any of the grounds mentioned in clause one. Section 33 of the, the county government act 2012, standing order 75 of the Senate, standing orders and the fifth schedule to the standing orders provide for the procedure to be followed in the hearing and determination of the proposed removal from office by impeachment of a governor. Eight, honorable senators, ladies and gentlemen, by way of a status update, update pursuant to rules 4A and 6 of part one of the fifth schedule to the Senate standing orders, the Senate invited the governor to appear and be represented before the Senate during the, its investigation. The Senate further invited the governor, if he chooses to appear before the Senate, to file an answer to the charges with the office of the clerk of the Senate by 5 p.m. On Saturday, 25th January 2020, setting out A, the governor's response to the particulars of allegations, B, the mode of appearance before the Senate, whether in person by advocate or uh, in person and by advocate, C, the names and addresses of the persons to be called as witnesses, if any, and witness statements containing a summary of the evidence to be presented by such witnesses before the Senate, and D, any other evidence to be relied on. Nine, pursuant to Rule 4, B and 7 of part one of the fifth schedule to the Senate standing orders, the Senate notified the county assembly of the date for the commencement of the investigations and invited the county assembly to designate members of the county assembly being not more than three members, if any, who shall appear before the Senate to represent the county assembly during the investigation. The county assembly was further invited if it chose to appear before the Senate to file with the office of the clerk of the Senate by 5 p.m on Saturday, 25th January 2020, documents A, designating the members of the county assembly being not more than three members, if any who shall attend and represent the assembly in the proceedings before the Senate. B, indicating the mode of appearance before the Senate, whether in person, by advocate or in person and by advocate. C, indicating the names and addresses of the persons to be called as witnesses, if any, and witness statements containing a summary of the evidence uh, to be presented by such witnesses before the Senate, and D, specifying any other evidence to be relied on. Honorable Senators, ladies and gentlemen, on Saturday, 25th January 2020, the Office of the Clerk of the Senate received a notice of preliminary objection to the invitation to appear issued to the Governor. The notice of preliminary objection also indicated that the Governor would appear before the Senate by his advocate, Mr. Ms. Mbugwanganga and company advocate. On the same day, the Office of the Clerk of the Senate also received a response to the inv to inv invitation to appear from Dr. Francis Ndirangu, the Acting Clerk, County Assembly of Kiambu, which provided A, the names of three members of the County Assembly designated to attend the and represent the Assembly in the proceedings before the Senate, and also stated that the County Assembly would, in, would appear in person and by advocate. The County Assembly did not indicate the name of the advocate. B, a list of four witnesses and their witness statements, and C, further evidence to be relied on. 12, pursuant to Rule 8 of Part 1 of the Fifth Schedule to the Senate Standing Orders, on Monday 27th, 2020, the Clerk of the Senate finished, uh, furnished each party with the documentation filed by the other party. 13, Honorable Senators, ladies and gentlemen, the hearing program which has been circulated details the various activities in the hearing and determination of the matter and the time allocated to each activity, it will be crucial that all the parties comply with the time allocated. In summary, the program says that today, 28th January 2020, after we have dispensed with preliminary matters, the, cha the charges against the governor as submitted by the county assembly shall be read to the governor. This will be followed by an opening statement to be made on behalf of the county assembly. Thereafter, an opening statement shall be made on behalf of the governor. After the conclusion of the opening statement, the presentation of the case of the county assembly shall commence and should take us up to the end of today's sitting. At the sitting scheduled for tomorrow, Wednesday, 29th January, 
2020, the governor will have an opportunity to present his case before the Senate. This will be followed by a closing statement on behalf of the county assembly as a closing statement on behalf of the governor. The Senate shall then proceed to a closed session for deliberations prior to voting on each of the charges in accordance with Section 337 of the County Government Act 2012 and Standing Order 756 of the Senate Standing Orders, the voting shall be by count, county delegations. The governor shall cease to hold office if a majority of all the county delegations of the Senate vote to uphold any impeachment charge. If, however, the vote in the Senate fails to result in the removal of a governor pursuant to Standing Order 757, the Speaker of the Senate shall notify the Speaker of the County Assembly of Kiambu accordingly. As I conclude, I would like to, to assure you that the Senate is cognizant of the gravity of the matter with which it is seized and shall accord the parties a fair hearing. Honorable Senators, ladies and gentlemen, I will now invite, I will now invite councils for the County Assembly of Kiambu, if any, to introduce the legal team of the County Assembly and the, me the members of the County Assembly of Kiambu representing the County Assembly by stating the full name and designation of each person. May it please the Honorable Speaker, the members of the Senate, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Senators, my name is Bude Gadenji. I am a counsel appearing for the County Assembly, and my team includes Mr. Nani Mungai and Mr. Karoga Maina, the members of the County Assembly designated for the purpose of these proceedings, uh, Honorable Solomon Kinudia Wambui, who is also the mover of the motion at the MCA level, and he is a member of County Assembly for the Delo Ward. The second one is Gideon Gashara Getao, Honorable Gideon uh, uh, Gashara Getao, he is a member of Country Assembly for Ndeya, and he is also the majority uh, leader. Honorable Yvonne Wajiku Aweru, who is also the chair for the implementation and law legal affairs. Honorable Speaker, we will be calling witnesses, and the witnesses are stated in the document uh, submitted to the House. Thank you. Honorable members, I now similarly invite counsel for the governor to introduce the legal team representing the governor and the governor by stating the full name and designation of each person. Um, honorable Speaker, Honorable Senators, on behalf of uh, the governor, uh, the representation is as follows. For the lawyers acting for the governor, there is Mr. Peter Wanyama, uh, who is present. Uh, there is Mr. Charles Jenga, who is also present. I'll be leading that team. My name is uh, Ngangambugwa. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I also wish to bring to the attention of the Senate that uh, the Honorable Governor of Kiambu County is personally present uh, before the Senate and will be answering to the charges of passion. That's as far as the representation goes. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Senate, I welcome the County Assembly team, the Governor's team, members of public, and the media to the Senate and to these proceedings. I thank you, and I welcome the uh, call upon the clerk to read the charges. The Honorable Ferdinand Dongo Waititu Bobayao, please take the stand.
Honorable Governor Ferdinand Ndongo Waitaitu Babayao, the charges against you as received from the County Assembly of Kiambu are as follows. Number one, gross violation of the Constitution of Kenya 2010, the County Governments Act 2012, the Public Finance Management Act 2012, and the Public Procurement and Disposal Act 2005. One, lack of accountability in the management of county resources by incurring unsustainable debts and other pending obligations to the tune of four billion. These pending obligations were never disclosed in the County Fiscal Strategy Paper 2019, thus violating Article 201C of the Constitution 2010 and Section 1072C of the Public Finance Management Act 2012. The County Executive, under the leadership of the County Governor, intentionally failed to draft the medium-term debt management strategy for the financial year 2018-2019 in contravention of Section 123 of the Public Finance Management Act 2012. This places Kiambu in a highly precarious financial position as it may lead to protracted and costly court battles with the creditors and eventual auctioning of county assets. Number two, violation of Articles 176, 1 and 185 of the Constitution of Kenya 2010 by disregarding the county assembly as an arm of the the county government and further undermining its three cardinal roles of legislation, oversight, and representation through systematic non remittance of requisition funds in the financial year 2018 2019. The governor diverted funds intended for use by the assembly to projects where he would obtain personal benefits through irregular procurement. This systematic crippling of the assembly operations compromises the independence of this honorable house. This unwritten edict of the county governor violates Article 6 and Article 10 of the Constitution of Kenya 2010 that engenders a spirit of mutual respect, cooperation, and consultation amongst all arms of government. Violation of Article 201A and D of the Constitution of Kenya 2010 that sets fundamental principles of public finance and further Section 5 and 131B1 of the Public Finance Management Act 2012. Violation of the Constitution of Kenya 2010, Articles 201A, D, and E on the principles of public finance Articles 227.1 on procurement of goods and services and public finance and public procurement and disposal act 2005 by failing to adhere to the stipulated dictates of the law in awarding Kenya shillings 2.1 billion road, tarmac, road tarmacking contracts against uh, as approved total roads, transport, public works and utilities budget of Kenya shillings 1.4 billion in the financial year 2018-2019. The purpose of the irregular awards was not to provide public roads, but was intended to enable the governor obtain personal benefit through kickbacks. This has exposed the county to huge losses through potential suits for breach of contract and or pending bills. Further, it has exposed the county assembly members to ridicule in their awards where promises to repair, stroke, construct roads were made on promises from the governor who had no intention of honoring the premises, uh, the promises. Three, failure to establish the county budget and economic forum as stipulated in section 137 of the Public Finance mm -hmm. Management Act 2012. As a result, the county governor has sabotaged public consultation as regards the preparation of the county plans and budgets ultimately violating the provisions of sections 87, 91, and 115 of the County Governments Act 2012, as well as Article 10 and 201A of the Constitution that demands involvement of the public in decision making. The failure was deliberate to create an atmosphere of chaos to facilitate the plunder and loss of public resources. Number two, crimes under the national law 
the county governor committed serious crimes under national law in the following way. Number one, violation of Article 40 of the Constitution of Kenya 2010 on the protection of every person's right to property and Section 155 of the Lands Act 2012, which bars unlawful acquisition and occupation of property through the forceful dispossession of Mrs. Cecilia Njoki Mbogwa, a widow of two prime plots of land within Thika municipality. The two plots, namely Thika municipality block 11 stroke 877 and Thika municipality uh, 878 were part of the widow's inheritance from her deceased husband. The county governor promptly facilitated the irregular transfer of the said land totaling to 0 0.135 hectares on the 2nd January 2018 to Mrs. Esther Wamoyo Nyatu, a common law wife of and mother of the children of the governor. The governor and his wife made admission to the ombudsman of the irregular acquisition of the land. The ombudsman is a constitutional body and its findings of fact implicate the governor in impeachable conduct. Three, abuse of office and gross misconduct. The county governor exhibited gross misconduct in the following ways. One, conflict of interest and contravention of the Public Procurement and Disposal Act 2005 in influencing the award of lucrative tenders to companies associated with immediate family and close re relatives. Two, violation of Section 74 of the County Governments Act 2012 by usurping the powers of the County Public Service Board to regulate the engagement of persons on contract, volunteers and casual workers in the County of Kiambu by directing by directly creating directorates and hiring staff on casual basis as directors and assistant directors, as well as sub-county administrators and ward administrators. Further to this, the county governor has hired over 600 casuals without the involvement of the public service board. <coughs> Upon realizing that he had broken the law, the governor caused all the said staff to be fired, exposing the county to risk of multiple suits and loss of public funds. Three, violation of Article 226, five of the Constitution of Kenya 2010, through the imprudent use of public funds in payment of staff without authorized staff establishment records as required under Section B52 of the County Public Service Human Resource Manual. Examination of the staff records and payroll by the Auditor General in 2017-2018 audit revealed that the county had employed 706 new employees, yet there were no positions advertised in the newspapers declaring vacant positions. Four, incurring unsustainable wage bill above the expected threshold of 35% in contravention of Regulation 25, 1B of the Public Financial Management, bracket County Government Regulations 2015. The statement of receipts and payments on wages and benefits for public officers serving in Kiambu County Government for the financial year 2017-2018 was Kenya shillings 5.9 billion, while the actual revenue collected during the year under review was Kenya shillings 12.6 billion, an indication that the percentage of wages and benefits of public officers to the total revenue was 47%. The net effect of the above audited scenario is unsustainable bloated wage bill. Therefore, revenue collected is used to finance wages instead of financing development projects that enhance service delivery and overall well-being of Kiambu County residents. Honorable Governor Waititu, how do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Honorable Senators, I will now give... Uh, 30 minutes to the for opening statement from the County Assembly of Kiambu. Honorable Speaker, Honorable Senators, uh, I'm Joroge Nani Mungai, Counsel for the County Assembly. And this is our opening statement. The speaker has started by setting out 
the mandate of this House uh, in these proceedings. And that mandate is to investigate and confirm that there is adequate evidence that substantiates the allegations made against the governor. The courts have ruled on that question, and there are two elements that I would like to bring to the attention of this House. The first, in the case of Martin Nyagawambora uh, versus the County Assembly of Embu and five others, Civil Appeal Number 194 of 2015, the Court of Appeal had occasion to consider the question of the removal of a governor. And it stated that the removal of a governor is not about criminality or culpability, but it is about accountability, political governance, as well as policy and political responsibility. The evidence that you will hear in the course of today will demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt that Governor Waitito has failed on the account of accountability, political governance, and political responsibility, and has done so in a manner that warrants his removal. The court then went on to ask the question of the threshold that is required to be demonstrated under Article 181 before a governor can be removed. And the court held that there must be a nexus between the governor's conduct and the alleged gross violations. So it's not enough for us to demonstrate that they were violations. We must be able to demonstrate that those violations are directly linked to the conduct of the governor. And in the course of today, this House will hear evidence uh, of the governor's direct involvement in acts of breach of the Constitution, breach of the law, as well as criminal conduct that had been investigated and established by a constitutional commission. And it will be our submission at the end that there, was, that there, that there, has, there is sufficient nexus between the governor's conduct and the alleged gross misconduct. At the end, when the Senate retires to deliberate, what you must ask is, do the facts and evidence support the impeachable charges? And it is our humble submission that when you look at that evidence, you will find that that will have been established. Now, a couple of points in terms of the evidence. The county assembly provided the evidence that was used in the impeachment, uh, and the speaker, uh, speaker has alluded to that. The notice of motion contained the evidence. We have also filed additional evidence and witness statements. What is not in dispute is that at no time has Governor Waitito disputed a single fact that has been presented not at the county assembly and not before you. So any allegations or facts that have been presented have been met by only one document, which is his notice of preliminary objection. So the question that you will have to ask is, in the absence of evidence from the governor and in light of the compelling evidence that you will have received from the county assembly, do you have sufficient evidence to impeach the governor? I don't wish to get into the details of the evidence at this point, but it is important for me to signpost to the Senate so that when we come to present the evidence, you are able to follow what it is that we are trying to do with the evidence. In respect of the charge there are three broad charges that are brought against the, the governor. The first is violation of the Constitution and the various stated statutes. 
the evidence that you will see with regard to violation of the Constitution and the stated statutes, the County Government Act, the Public Finance Act, will lead to one irresistible inference. There was a concerted and consistent effort by the governor to subvert the checks, balances, and controls that have been put in place to safeguard public finances. So you will see that when it comes to the budgeting process, the law and the constitution requires that you not only budget, but you do not procure anything that is outside of that budget. You will see that that stipulation will have been violated. When it comes to the question of the breach of international or national law, this is where you will find some fairly shocking evidence. And it is shocking at three levels. Governor Waititu used his office, the office of the, the, county, uh, the county government has a mandate of fiscal planning under the constitution. You will find evidence that a widow who was left property by her husband her deceased husband, applied for planning approvals. When she applied for that planning approvals, the county government involved itself in machinations to try and frustrate that process, including trying to compulsorily acquire that land. The widow had to go to court to compel the county to undertake its mandate. Now that's not the shocking part. The shocking part is that the widow received a telephone call that called her to the governor's office. And the governor personally, personally demanded from her that she transfer two parcels of land. And those parcels of land were to be transferred to his wife so that she could get the um, approvals that she needed. Um, because of her desperate situation, she did that. But fortunately, the Constitution provides a remedy for her. And she went to the Commission for Administration uh, of Justice, the Ombudsman, and made a formal complaint. The Constitution and the Act that sets up the CAJ provides a mechanism that allows one to complain and empowers the CAJ, the CAJ to inter alia investigate abuse of office. So she went to the right forum. The CAJ carried out detailed investigations, called Mr. Waitito, called his wife, and they confirmed that the property had been transferred to the wife for no consideration. The CAJ made a finding in a ruling that implicated Ferdinand Waitito personally for that particular offense and ordered that the property be retransferred, and that was done. So when you are uh, retire to, to, to deliberate. I think this is one of those um, uh, offenses for which um, really, apart from breaching the constitution, article 40, the right to property, apart from breaching the law in terms of abuse of, uh, of office, this conduct is contrary to the Bible. Exodus 22 tells us, do not oppress a widow. And if you do, the wrath of God shall be upon you. But I do not wish that the senators uh, look at Exodus. Uh, Governor Waitito will meet his maker on his day, judgment day, and he will be able to, to deal with that. But you will find that the evidence shows that this is a man who not only breaches the constitution and the law, but one who is not even afraid of the wrath of God. The last category of evidence that we shall be submitting to you relates to conflict of interest. And the conflict of interest charges are linked to the first group of charges. In the first group of charges, we told you there was a systematic weakening and destruction of the safeguards for public, uh, for the safeguarding of public uh, uh, funds. And there was a reason why Governor Waititu did this. And the reason is that having weakened the systems, Governor Waititu then proceeded to put at the disposal of his family the resources of the people of Kiambu. 
procurement contracts were done that resulted in Governor Waititi's wife and daughters all receiving funds from the county assembly of uh, from the from the county budget. The, this was a clear conflict of interest. The evidence you will see has the tenders, the award letters, the CR12s from the county uh, from the lands office demonstrating that uh, these uh, 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 properties and monies were going to contracts were going to Waititi's wives. The only thing that one could say, uh, one may commend uh, Governor Waititi for, is that he doesn't discriminate. Uh, when it came to looting public resources and giving them to their wives, he gave each wife uh, resources. <laughs> so it is going to be the county assembly's case that the governor systematically weakened the controls so as to put the resources of the county into his family's hands. The last evidence that we will submit is with regard to illegal employment. The employment of county officers is governed by the law and the responsibility of recruitment is with the public service board. Governor Waititi systematically disregarded that law and employed over 600 people directly. And the letters of appointment are there. You will see them. They are signed by, by himself uh, 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 directly in total disregard of the law. Um, at some point when there were investigations about disappointments by the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, the governor decided to sack these people. So you have double jeopardy for, for the people of Kiambu. On the one hand, people are employed irregularly. But on the second hand, they are now uh, saddled with potential claims by persons who have been irregularly terminated. It will be our submission at the end that there is compelling evidence and facts none of which have been controverted by the governor to um, substantiate the allegations. And for those reasons, we will be then asking that this Senate um, do undertake its mandate of protecting devolution. Protection of devolution um, includes protecting it from persons who choose to violate um, the purpose for which devolution was instituted. The reason this country passed the 2010 constitution partly was that we wanted resources to go to the people closer. The devolution provisions were not intended to devolve corruption um, to the grassroots, which is what uh, Governor Waititi and his conduct, as revealed by the evidence and facts, which he has not controverted, will do. For, so that's uh, the opening statement on, on behalf of the county assembly. And uh, this afternoon, we will lead the, the House through the evidence. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your opening statements. I now invite uh, Sen uh, Governor Waititu, uh, Waititu's Council to give his opening statements. 30 minutes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir. Uh, I want to have some few minutes as for my opening statement. Then I donate some of my minutes to my lawyer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, I will start by thanking the Senate for giving me this chance and opportunity to be heard. A chance that I was denied at the county assembly. Uh, it is important to mention that I had sent my lawyers, because I feared the humiliation of and the shouting match that could have been in the assembly, I sent my two lawyers, and they were there representing me, but they were never given a chance to, to give my answers to all these questions that uh, have been leveled against me. 
I also want to mention that all the answers are lying at the office of the sergeant at arms, and the answers are there, and I wish the, the speaker will allow that those answers come to the honorable members. Mr. Speaker, sir, I listened carefully to all the accusations, and I also listened and watched the deliberations of the Senate uh, last week, and I must say that I'm happy to know that all the governors who have gone through the Senate, that alone has also had an impact in their counties, positive impact, and I hope that after this process, there will be a serious positive impact in the whole of Kiambu County. Mr. Speaker, sir, Kiambu County, since I was elected, the politics did not start, stop when I went to the office. There has been a lot of propaganda through social media, bloggers being paid by politicians to malign my name, and it has gone to a level that they always get away with the propaganda and achieve their goals. They repeat a lie so many times, and it end up looking like it is the truth. Some of you know very well that some times ago, there was an, an article that went viral that my daughter was found with an account of 100 million. It was found to be untrue. She had an account with only 9,000 shillings. That is the level of propaganda that is in Kiabu County. What I want to tell you, Mr. Speaker, is that now that the matter has come to this house, and I strongly believe that this house has the mandate to give the residents of Kiambu and the whole country the truth that they require, the justice that they require. And the justice also should come to, should also extend to me as, a, as the accused person. Mr. Speaker, sir, when I was given the notice of the motion, the assembly took over 14 days, in fact, 17 days, to deliberate on a special motion. They went against the Kiambu studying orders, as a county assembly studying orders, which requires that a special motion be disposed of within 14 days. Mr. Speaker, sir, when it came to that day in the assembly, I was never given a chance to be heard. And I personally had sent my lawyers who are there sitting and they were recognized from the morning and they were waiting that, uh, to be heard after the accusations and they were never given that chance, Mr. Speaker. That same day, because of that culture of believing in propagating lies and knowing that they have been succeeding in propaganda, a house that had 57 members only since the whole day of deliberation. Mr. Speaker, the threshold in Kiambu County as stipulated in the standing orders, the, uh, the county government standing orders, is two-thirds. In Kiambu County, we have 92 members. The two-thirds are supposed to be 62 members for the motion. Mr. Speaker, sir, that threshold was not there in the assembly. There were only 57 members, and one of the members there voted no. Who was my, who voted no in my support? And he was there throughout the day, and he's here. He can testify to that. And Mr. Speaker, sir, the motion that has been brought before the Senate, having not met the required threshold. Honestly speaking, having been a member of parliament twice, 
having also been a member of the county assembly of Kiambu and the former deputy governor of Nairobi, honestly speaking, numbers count. It is the constitution. It is the guideline that this and this must be done. This way, there are clear procedures and directions. Honestly speaking, however bad I might look politically or otherwise, or whatever people should think, but honestly speaking, I, must, I should be given justice. I'm just pleading to this house that as a, normal, as a, as a, as a Kenyan, I should be given justice like anybody else, and that is why, honestly speaking, the Constitution guarantees everybody fair hearing and fair judgment. Mr. Speaker, sir, when the motion, which, according to me, did not meet the threshold, was brought to the Senate, they did also not meet the days that are required. They are supposed to bring the motion after two days. They brought that motion to the Senate after four days. Mr. Speaker, sir, that is a breach of the procedures and the studying orders of the Senate and of the county assembly. Mr. Speaker, sir, I would also like to mention that the Senate studying orders also mentions clearly that seven days are required by to, to summon the Senate. Mr. Speaker, sincerely speaking, members were called well above the seven days. Mr. Speaker, I just, I'm just requesting you, because I know some of you in 2022 will be governors, like it happened last time. Some senators became governors. Even in this house, I know a big number of you will also become governors. You will also come here and you require justice to be done to you. <laughs> it would, you will come here. I was in this compound for two terms as an MP. And I have now come back here in the dock. I'm sure some of you will also come here. <laughs> and you will require justice to be done to you. I just beseech you. I just beseech you to do justice to me as a Senate. Mr. Speaker, sir, all accusations have been said. I have experts in the county who deal with finance, highly qualified uh, staff. And Mr. Speaker, sir, some of those accusations, as you have heard them, they, have been, they were handled by, by different people in the county who are qualified to do that work in the finance procurement. I'm not part of the procurement process. And I want to tell you as a house that there are so many things that happen in a county that has over 8,000 employees. And I cannot be held accountable by any, by any means of everything that happens to people who are employed there. Yes, I'm the governor, but honestly speaking, there are those committees that I chair, but where I have no mistake, I beseech you not to, not just to be fair. Mr. Speaker, it has been said about the, the lady and the plots at Vika. Mr. Speaker, sir, I want my accusers here to produce a single document, a single evidence that implicates me. The persons are adults that dealt with that matter. And I have so many relatives who do deal with so many things. Some, because I'm the governor, obviously want to enjoy that title of the governor. But they should be held accountable of what they do. I should be held accountable of what I do personally as the governor. I never myself called the lady, as indicated here. If there is any proof, let the accusers produce. I never at all requested the registrar to transfer the, the plots. If there is any proof, please produce the proof. 
I was never called by Obutsman myself. All these issues have come when I, I was uh, when I was taken to court over the corruption case, and I'm still pushing with my case. And there are so many people who are in court with the cases. I'm just one of them, and I'm still innocent until proven guilty. Honestly speaking, you cannot nail me because of a case that is going on, and I have not been found guilty. I'm just requesting, please. The case in court, let it continue. I might be proven innocent. Who knows? And honestly speaking, if you pin me because of that case, you will not have done justice to me. So what I'm requesting you, honestly speaking, is that you do all the fairness that is supposed to be done to, to a, a human being. Listen to the facts and evidence, but not propaganda. Kiambu is known for serious propagandists. <laughs> that is the Kiambu, that is the nature of Kiambu. And it is my sincere hope. It is my sincere hope. You have seen, even you, you know the politics in Kiambu right now. And I want you not to judge me because of those politics. Please. Make sure, you, or you are, you, 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 Mr. Speaker, that after all these deliberations, you will change the, 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 the narrative of Kiambu people, the thinking that they can propagate lies and succeed, that they can hold somebody if, if they can succeed in getting rid of somebody just because you don't want that person. I'm, I'm a victim of that, but I want to request this house that just do justice to me, just be fair to me, just look at the facts and evidence as adduced. I have all the answers of the, 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 the accusations in the sergeant at arms office. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you. I, I now call upon uh, my, my lawyer to just for two minutes to sum up what he had said. My 30 minutes, I think. Do we have time? Mr. Speaker. Oh, you have 18 minutes. Huh? 18 minutes. Thank yeah. you very much. I'll actually take less and yield a few more minutes to my learned colleague, Mr. Jenga. Now, Honorable uh, Mr. Speaker, Honorable Senators, uh, today we gather before this august house to discharge a most noble and solemn task that only this Senate can undertake. Mr. Speaker, and this is the consideration of the proposed removal from office by way of impeachment of a popularly elected governor of the second most populous county in this country. Mr. Speaker, this task underlies the supremacy of this house. No other house in this country has the sovereign power to terminate the social contract between a governor and his people, or even the president and his people. Being such a solemn duty, Mr. Speaker, it calls for a lot of restraint and great circumspection. The tool of impeachment correctly understood should only be deployed as a measure of last resort and where it has been shown that all other oversight mechanisms have either failed or otherwise inadequate. It is a duty, Mr. Speaker, that this House has been called into action to undertake. Before it undertakes that duty, Mr. Speaker, this Senate has an obligation to audit the entire process that was undertaken by the Assembly and satisfy itself that that process was proper, lawful, and valid. This is particularly important, Mr. Speaker, because this Senate was not conceived to rubber stamp decisions and resolutions passed by the Assembly. Far from it. Primarily, the Senate was conceived to protect counties and its governments. So one of those protections is to protect elected governors who are the CEOs of those counties. It is important, Mr. Speaker, that this Senate protects governors from 
marauding assemblies who might seek to deploy impeachment too for their own selfish motives. We're saying this, Mr. Speaker, because this House is comprised of noblemen and women of great character and integrity, and whom we believe that at an appropriate time they will rise to the occasion and make a determination on the facts, the evidence, and the law, and find that the charges that have been presented or that will be presented before the Senate lacks any basis. There are some critical preliminary issues, Mr. Speaker, that my learned friend will advert to uh, in his opening remarks, and I do not wish to um, rehash those because Mr. Jenga will deal with those, and this has to do with whether the governor was given opportunity to be heard before the assembly, whether the constitutional and statutory timelines before the assembly were complied with, whether there was public participation, and whether indeed some of the charges contravenes the subjudice uh, standing order of this honorable Senate. Just very briefly, Mr. Speaker, on the facts. You've been told that we have not controverted the facts and the evidence. First, it is the governor's case that he was not given a chance to be heard by the assembly. So the opportunity to controvert that evidence at that preliminary level was deprived. So it cannot then lie in the mouth of the assembly to say that the governor has not controverted the charges, the facts, and the evidence. Mr. Speaker, as relates to the documents that we have filed, yes, we did file a notice of preliminary objection when we were served with the invitation to appear, but it was not possible, Mr. Speaker, within the three days that we had been allowed to present substantive evidence. We shall, as soon as we finish making the opening remarks, make an appropriate application under the relevant provisions of the standing orders for admission of that evidence out of time. I will revisit that um, shortly. Now, Mr. Speaker, you will, you will be told that there was alleged violation of the Constitution, PFMA, and the Public Procurement Assets and Disposal Act that there were unsustainable debts that were incurred. What I do not know, what we don't understand is which law provides or criminalizes what is called unsustainable debts. You've been told that the governor has been undermining the assembly business by not remitting funds to the assembly. That allegation is not founded on the evidence that we shall be producing. You have been, or rather you've been told that there was failure to adhere to budgetary estimates in procurement and alleged failure to establish the county budget and economic forum. Those allegations are baseless, subject to admission of the evidence that we shall be producing. We shall demonstrate that that is not factual. Mr. Speaker, as regards allegations to do with conflict of interest, it is important, Mr. Speaker, to point out that that particular charge is the subject of active criminal litigation. Mr. Speaker, we shall be raising an objection in as far as that particular charge is concerned as to its admissibility or consideration by this Senate when it is indeed subject matter of a court process. Mr. Speaker, there are no impeachable grounds that we call crimes under national law. The impeachable ground should be reasons to believe. So we shall be raising again an issue as to how that particular charge is crafted and whether indeed it can found a basis of an impeachable offense under Article 181 of the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, regarding the issue of uh, staffing again and procurement, we shall be demonstrating to you that there is absolutely no direct nexus between the alleged violations and the conduct of the governor. The governor plays no role in the procurement process. Yes, he might be the CEO of the county. He does not award tenders. He does not evaluate tenders. He does not sign contracts. So what you will not be told is where the evidence with regard to those subject tenders is and where the governor's hand is. You will not be told all that. You'll be told about alleged high wage bill as a ground for impeachment. This is a national issue, Mr. Speaker. It cuts across all counties, and the reasons are diverse. 
delayed release from exchequer, inherited debts from the previous regime. Now, all those have been lumped together to couch an alleged charge of alleged unsustainable wage bill that has been flowerly crafted to say that the county of Kiambu is threatened with auction. Far from it, Mr. Speaker. We will be demonstrating that that phenomenon has nothing to do with the conduct of the speaker. Oh, sorry, of the governor. On the whole, we shall be urging this Senate to reject all the grounds, all the charges for not having been proved, Mr. Speaker. I will yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Jenga to make some brief opening remarks on the process issues and the legal deficiencies of the motion that was presented to the Speaker of the Senate by the Speaker of the Assembly. I yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Only have 10 minutes, so uh, allow me to dive right into it. Um, mine is to speak to a few legal issues that are very material to this gathering or to this session. The court has said, in the, in the case cited by my senior, who interestingly was my pupil master and my trainer, Mr. Nani Mungai, that the jurisdiction of the Senate, the mandate of the Senate to hear an impeachment flows from a resolution of the county assembly. So without a resolution, this gathering is not properly constituted. This session uh, to hear the charges against the governor cannot be legally and competently moved without a proper resolution of the county assembly. And why do I say this? Because in the proper and exhaustive evaluation of the facts, you will realize that these are fraud upon the Senate. The law is clear to the extent that it provides for a number threshold required to pass a resolution for the removal of a governor. The law says two thirds. When you have two thirds, then you have a valid resolution. The evidence available, and that will be demonstrated, shows that on the material date, only 57 members of the County Assembly of Kiambu were available and participated. That by itself, even without further interrogation, calls into the question of the validity of the resolution and invites the Senate to make a determination as to whether it has been properly moved to hear and determine these proceedings or these charges. The law has said, and the courts have said, that there cannot be justice without the law. I know we are all itching to proceed to the facts. We are all itching to remove the governor, the country is in the mood, people in the mood, but the law is there to safeguard all of us. We are here before a legislature. We are here before the Senate of the Republic of Kenya, which is enjoined under Article 94 to protect the Constitution and the democratic governance of the Republic. So the law is an issue and we have to consider it as a preliminary issue. The second thing that calls into the investigation of this uh, Senate is the question of statutory timelines, where the law provides a statutory timeline within which an action should be done and resolved, then there cannot be any other argument. If we are to be loyal uh, to, be, to pledge allegiance and uh, to be subservient to the law, then we must interrogate our own processes and confirm at the first instance whether we are compliant with the law. The governor is here on allegations of violations of law and the constitution. Before we put him to the sword, we have to look within ourselves and confirm whether we are properly constituted. And I say that based on the material evidence before this house that shows that this house was notified on the 23rd of, 23rd of December, right before Christmas. The law requires, in no asante terms, 
that the Senate be convened within seven days. That is section 33. It does not give any conditions. It does not give any accommodation or latitude to extend that time. The facts herein show Senate was convened on the 21st of January. Senator Baringo, Senator Baringo, take your seat. Okay, proceed, Council. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for that protection. Senate was convened by the Speaker on the 21st of January, 28 days later. The law says seven days shall within seven days convene the Senate to hear charges. We were convened 21, 28 days later. So clearly, we cannot ignore the, the critical issues of law that call to account and to issue the validity of the proceedings that we are now in. And we shall raise them in material detail when we are prosecuting our preliminary objection but it's important to say that that is an issue that we shall be raising as a preliminary issue. The third thing, as I sit, you have been told that there are many allegations against the governor. Yes, they are. And you can see them in the, in the grounds set out. This house has had occasion to hear over eight such impeachment motions and proceedings. And this Senate has said in reports in matters that I've personally participated in, that it is not enough to allege. So what, honorable senators, you must look for is evidence. When you're told a title was transferred, you must ask for that transfer and find out who signed it. If you're told that, uh, that uh, persons were employed, you must interrogate the process. When you're told that the governor accumulated debts, you must find out whether those debts occurred or were incurred during his tenure or the inherited debts, what the Auditor General has said about those debts, because all those are factors that have not been disclosed to you. And when you look at them in the very end, you'll be surprised that these are mere allegations. They are high in hype and emotion, but deficient on the evidence. The question and the game here is evidence. That is what you must look for. And in the totality of the facts before you, and I've looked at the documents filed by the county assembly, there is no evidence filed to support the allegations. And so we shall be saying in our final submissions that the, the charges before this house have not been substantiated. We shall be making extensive reference to previous reports of this house, because this is a house of precedent. And there are certain things it has said, these are not impeachment questions. Questions like convening a county budget forum, the house has said those are not impeachment questions. They have to rise to a level and to the stature of gross violations as anticipated by Article 181 and Section 33. And therefore, our submission in open, uh, in, in, in support of the governor's case, is that before you, what you have are politically instigated allegations that are deficient in evidence and cannot be substantiated. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, thank you very much, Council for both sides and uh, the County Assembly of uh, Kiambu and uh, the Governor of Kiambu. Uh, Honorable Senators, you have heard from the opening statements, weighty matters raised on both sides, and therefore, as per our program, the House will adjourn for lunch and reconvene at 2 p.m. Two.